Servus. <lacht> I'm with um, it, man. Let's go. I'm with it. All right, cool, cool. I guess um I know that you were an extra on Spike Lee's Malcolm X. Did it feel like a full <laughs> circle moment to get this film? Yeah, that was that was a little crazy to think about that. Um yeah, wow, yeah. Uh, did Malcolm X and then now I'm doing probably uh I, I think this this performance of Malcolm will be equally remembered. Yeah. And equally revered. So I had a toe in both projects. So. <laughs> but no, it's kind of funny. Yeah, I just thought about that now as you said it. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 I I tend to like try to find the poetry in a lot yeah. of the moments. And there's so many moments in this film where I was just writing things down that like really hit me in some way. And um, so I think that's what I'd like to do with you. There's a series of moments in the film that I would like to bring to your attention and try to get your thoughts on them. Because as Let's a viewer, it, it's uh, for me, it's the lessons that I absorb. Like, yeah. this is one of those films that I think anybody can watch. And then there's the the person that you are before watching it and the person that you are after watching <laughs> that's it. That's exactly and, it. Yes. Cool. There's a scene where Malcolm X is talking to, well, everybody, but specifically mm -hmm. Sam Cooke. And he says something along the lines of, it's too important of a time to be, to waste a brilliant mind on pandering. And mm -hmm. so I know we're taught our entire lives to speak our truth, but this was like a moment that just kind of like put things into perspective of how we should say things, speak our truth, and not do it just because we want to be liked. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder, like, when you see that conversation in the script, what does it do for you? What sort of wisdom does it impart? It reinforces the need to, like you said, speak your truth, you know, uh, and address areas where you're actively negating your, your um, your own value. And oftentimes, you know, people can be people pleasers, right? We're taught that to get to this particular place in life or to be around here, I need to do this. I need to, to massage this person's ego. And, you know, maybe I can't say what I need to say, or maybe I can't um, be who I am naturally, right? Just because we think that there's a greater result at the end of that. But really, if we're just in those moments lying to ourselves, not being authentic to ourselves, we're putting ourselves in, in an and inauthentic situation. Um, I believe the universe will continue to challenge you until you own up to your own value and stop waiting on the sidelines. So yes, be bold, be brazen, be honest with yourself so that you can be honest with other people. And it is quite um, scary because you're thinking about if, if I'm just dishonest about here and here and I don't like this and if I speak up here, either people don't like me or I might get fired or whatever, the risk that you're calculating in your head, the assumption of it is far more, usually far more fearful mm -hmm. than the actual results in real life. So be fearless and speak up. There's respect for people who speak up. And a lot of times we're taught to be docile when really that only allows us to serve someone else's agenda as opposed to our own. And I think that's what um, Malcolm was really trying to get at in this moment is that we have an agenda that we need to meet. And this is why we can't afford to sit here and wait on because if we keep quiet, if we, you know, stay safe, you know, all these things will continue to happen to us, but it needs to stop. And we are the ones who make it stop. Right. Right. And I suppose that's why I gravitate towards Jim Brown as a character and a personality because even Malcolm X highlighted that he has his fearlessness. And then you can watch like all these interviews, um, for instance, the interview on the Dick Cavett show with Jim Brown, like Love that's that. such a remarkable conversation. And, but yet he's just so calm, collected and uh, yeah. speaking the truth. Yeah, that is, uh, that is one of my favorite interviews because of his composure. But what most people don't get about his composure is that he has two challenges. He has to one, convince people there to be willing to listen to him because they're automatically predisposed to, to turn their ears off. Mm -hmm. And once they're willing to listen to him, he has to then convince them 
through his actions that he's reasonable enough for them to consider that he just may be right. right. He is, he has to convince people to respect him given his composure. Mm -hmm. uh, Lester Maddox, who lost his mind, yeah. is afforded the luxury and the comfort of losing his mind and, and still being respected for losing his mind. If Jim lost his mind, then they say, well, see, this is why we don't talk to you. This is why you don't have this, that, you know. So he loses all merit. Lester, staunch racist, mm -hmm. can lose his mind and still have reverence. And, and Jim has to maintain his composure as much as possible, even though he's the one speaking all of the sense in the world. That is the same challenge that we have for ages. That's the same challenge we have today. Right. You know, uh, people like to compare you know, protested Black Lives Matter versus what happened at the Capitol. And you've got to realize Black Lives Matter process, they have maintained their composure. Mm -hmm. versus people at the Capitol losing their minds. The duality is not surprising because it is the nature of how things have been treated and how certain cultures have been treated in this country for a while. So Jim knows how to play the game to win. Yeah, for sure. And he knows the long game. That's why he maintains his composure because he knows who he's dealing with. And he knows how to speak the language to get somebody to understand a sense of reason. It's not even about changing your perspective to agree with me. I just want to open your mind to a sense of reason. There's one scene in particular that probably was my favorite scene in the whole film. And it's when um, you say something, your character says something along the lines of, uh, some white folks, they're looking, they can't wait for to pat themselves on the oh, back. back. <laughs> that line has like such a weight to it. And, and that's like, you know, props to Kim Powers for being such a fantastic writer. But how do you approach something when that moment stands out to me in the film? I don't know how it is to you when you're reading the script. How do right. you approach a moment like that, that just feels like it has such a force to it compared to any other part of the film? Oh, well, uh, I, I appreciate you saying so about the scene. Thank you. It's, it's one of my favorite scenes uh, as well in the film between uh, Jim and Malcolm. And the way I approach it is from a place of um, truth and familiarity, because I have dealt with, uh, you know, people before and having been treated in such a way where I felt that, you know, or it's like you don't realize you just treated me like trash and you think that's okay <laughs> you know or did you just say what i think you just said <laughs> you know i have been treated like less than a human being on a number of occasions even to the point of you know dealing with certain you know jobs uh working you know high up and you realize your job doesn't mean anything people see you as they've been taught to or choose to see you so i completely understand this mentality there and because i understand the weight of it from my personal experience, I just approach it with truth in that I hope it lands so that people can realize this is not how I want to think. It's how I'm taught to think through experience and now I have to protect myself because when I engage something like this, which is more often than people might uh, understand, more often now too, mm -hmm. um, when you engage that, you have to figure out how do I deal with this without allowing myself to stoop to your level of intellect. Right. How do I get past this while maintaining my dignity, even though you have no none for me? Yeah. You know? um, so I appreciate that you you said that stood out and that, you know, because one of the greatest things that I hope for this film in terms of the audience, and that's the audience all over, is that, you know, they do take away something where it engages a thought for or provokes a thought of growth and because it provokes so many thoughts of growth for me and i hope to share that experience with the audience so i really appreciate that you know you had that experience especially with that line yeah what did this narrative structure um provide does it cause you to look at a moment from your own life that maybe is somewhat comparable where you kind of felt like the ground move beneath your feet so there were quite a few moments that were comparable to what I've experienced in my own life. And when it came to the narrative structure, what I realized that there's a rhythm to it. It's um, Kemp uh, composed an orchestral piece with this particular script with the way he placed in, uh, in different beats and moments. 
-hmm. the narrative structure is to a degree taking people through a journey of what it means to <laughs> deal with what we deal with figure out the struggle of, of how to go through it and then coming out on the end with actually getting to a point of, of having to deal with that struggle so i feel like if people are paying attention enough they they understand that this is a real journey we're taking you on when we say certain things when we stand up for our rights when we um protest or when we you know what we're saying we're trying to explain to you this is why this is exactly why this is why it's necessary mm -hmm. and for those of us who do protest i'm talking about everybody who supports in the in the value of, of equity and equality for all for those of us who do it helps give them a sense of understanding this is why we continue you know right yeah like when it comes to Jim Brown or looking at characters from, you know, straight out of Compton, hidden figures down the line. Do you continue to research? Do you still stay invested in them? Uh, it depends. Usually I will put it down. Uh, and that's just how I am with any job. I sometimes will pick up things and find out things uh, or engage, investigate things um, just for curiosity, you know. As the film rolls out, something will catch me on, but I'll go look it up. But typically I'll put something down. Once it's done, it's done. And that allows me to just then go watch the film and then experience it from a place where I'm not working. Mm -hmm. I get to just sort of be an audience member because filming it and, and, and watching it are two wholly completely different experiences. And I need to sort of watch it like at least two or three times before my brain shuts off from doing work and says, oh, okay, now this is what this is, you know, and I can enjoy it. But you know, I, I, when I watched this particular film, I was automatically an audience member because I was so blown away with how well everything came together. Yeah. So I was happy to do to have that experience. So, yeah, usually I step away just so I can take a break, breathe and disconnect and, and just go into it and enjoy, you know, the fruits of our labor. This ain't about civil rights. They ain't giving black people what they really want. What's that? Hey, I was made in America. That's why I'm out here saving America. Power. Black power. I like the sound of that. Uh, I wish I lived in America. We have to be there for each other. Uh, heard everybody rich. All I gotta do is run, jump, kick. I'm a kick in your area. Uh, I done made it to America. Uh, I'm amazed uh, at America. Welcome to America. <laughs>